Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Corbett from Barclays, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to Women in Football's latest webinar, uh, which have been running throughout the pandemic to, uh, to great acclaim. Barclays and Women in Football have been partners now for well over 10 years, uh, and we, we continue to admire their passion and their dedication to making football open and welcome to all. And the last few days have shown us how very important the work that they do is in this space. We share that commitment and alongside Women in Football, we're working in close partnership with the FA to make football available to all girls in England, as well as driving the elite game forwards through our investment in the Barclays FA Women's Super League. So it really is a pleasure for me to open this panel today. I'm sure everyone on the line is looking forward to an informative discussion about the future of the women's game uh, and the importance of women in leadership. With that, I want to give my thanks to Claire, uh, who's our host for this online event today. Claire really needs no introduction uh, from me, but I'll, but I'll give a small one, being a, a BAFTA Special Award winner and one of the UK's greatest ever broadcasters. Uh, it would be difficult to find a better host for today's topic. Uh, Claire's the recipient of the RTS Presenter of the Year Award for her coverage of women's sport and is one of the UK's most influential and trusted voices in, in the women's game and women's sport overall. She's very passionate about shining a light on some of the inspirational female, female players and their stories, raising the profile of the elite women's game to a wider audience and inspiring the next generation of young women, which I know is so very important to all of us on, on this call today. So with that, Claire, I'll hand over to you to kick things off. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, I'm also so excited to be the one who's presenting the big weekend of women's football on uh, BT Sport. Uh, both of the big derbies are going to be free to air across BT's channels and on YouTube. And actually all matches this weekend, you can find coverage of them for, for the first time ever, either on the BBC or BT Sport or the FA Player. And that is, I think, a real sign of maximising this opportunity of getting young kids and adults to appreciate the skill and the talents at the top level of women's football. And fair to say that women's sport has suffered even more this year and disproportionately so because of COVID. And, and also because of the wavering commitment from those who control the purse strings. And that is why it's so valuable um, to the FA, to the WSL, to women in football to have a partner like Barclays that truly believes in its potential to entertain, but also to inspire. And I've always felt that women's sport has the power to change lives, to increase um, confidence for girls and women, and to allow them the freedom to expand their horizons and give voice to their ambition. And I think for women to be seen at the elite level, working together as a team, taking the knocks, being quite happy to take a hard ball, to be honest, uh, recovering if they make a mistake, taking risks, linking up together, celebrating success or consoling each other in defeat, all of these things matter in life and it's the broader message that is sent out there every time a match is played and shown on TV that I think has a massive impact and when crowds are allowed back I honestly think they will come flooding to WSL matches and this weekend is a really important showcase of what they can look forward to seeing in person so make sure you spread the word everyone who's joining us today that all of those matches are available to watch, free to view uh, across the BT Sport um, network and on YouTube, but also on BBC or FA Player for every single match. But Manchester United versus Manchester City on Saturday from 12 noon, Arsenal versus Chelsea on Sunday uh, from 2.30. So we have a panel here representing all sides of the game with expertise in governance, coaching, a grassroots and elite level playing. Let's say hello to our four fabulous women. First up, the Bristol City manager, Tanya Oxterby, who was a top class player in her native Australia and here in the UK, playing for Perth Glory, Doncaster Bells and Everton. And when she turned her attention to coaching, she found her calling. She's been involved with Perth Glory as well as developing young Australian talent with the under 20s young Matildas and now is in charge of the WSL side, Bristol City. So welcome to Tanya. It has been one of those weeks at the FA, so we're particularly grateful to Kelly Simmons for being with us today. Kelly is the Women's Professional Game Director at the FA, with the remit of helping deliver and transform professional women's football in England. She's recently been appointed to the Board of Women in Football. She oversees the FA Women's Super League, FA Women's Championship, FA Women's National League, and the Women's Pyramid of Football. And Kelly was previously the FA Director of Participation and Development 
and oversaw the implementation of a 200 million pound four year investment program into children's and uh, grassroots football. So welcome Kelly, thank you for being with us. Now, when you're looking for a player who has experienced everything, who understands the pressures of being at your best when it matters most, who is living proof that hard work, dedication, and a steely resolve will pay off. One who sees the bigger picture and who always has something to offer. I would say that Jill Scott should be the first name on your team sheet. She was due to make her 150th appearance for England, had the match against Germany gone ahead. She's the second most capped player ever for the national side and a crucial member of the Manchester City squad. In fact, her teammate Lucy Bronze described her as one of the most influential players of the last decade in terms of what she brings to the team and also made reference to her being dead funny off the pitch. So welcome to Jill, who's come to us fresh from training. And completing our incredible panel is Francesca Brown, the Managing Director and CEO of Goals for Girls, a football development programme which works with young women aged 11 to 16. And this is another example of the greater power of football with the programme aiming to break down barriers and reduce inactivity amongst young women by raising their aspirations, self-confidence, self-esteem, and strengthening that all important mental approach, inspiring them to set and achieve their goals. So welcome to Fran. That is our panel. And then of course, there are the 500 or so of you, um, and we would love you to introduce yourself on the chat, select all attendees, say who you are, what you do, where you're from. There'll be an opportunity as well at the end uh, for your questions to be answered. So we would love to know what you think. Um, Megan Rapinio spoke earlier this week about the importance of having more women in positions of power, more women in leadership. So first off for all of our panel, I'd love to know about your personal experience of getting to the top and what you've learned along the way. Tanya, can I start with you and, and the importance of seeing women in leadership and indeed becoming one yourself? I think for me, I grew up in a really small country town and um, I was the only female that played football. And I think a lot of um, a lot of footballers journeys of, you know, footballers of my age, I suppose, um, have a similar journey. And um, all the way through, there wasn't a lot of um, females in, in leadership roles, um, not a lot of female role models, if you like. And I think for me, I, I indirectly kind of fell into one of those roles um, just as a player and, and being a captain and didn't really understand, you know, I didn't really understand what that meant. Um, and it wasn't until I got a little bit older and um, after my experience over here in England, I, I went back home to Perth and um, I set up my own, my own coaching business because I, I thought to myself, actually, I don't want other female um, footballers or um, those that are aspiring to, to do something positive with their life to not have positive role models and um, for me that was a bit of a changer a bit of a game changer I, I wanted to bring all of the you know all of the, the female players that that mean so much to um, every young young footballer out there together and created my own coaching company we did grassroots we did development stuff and from there, I think that that kind of clicked for me that we need to be visible. We need to be showing young females that um, they can do whatever they want to um, and that there will be barriers along the way. I know you mentioned that earlier and we will get knocked down, but there are success stories out there in all walks of life. So, um, you know, I think everybody's been challenged this year with with where we're at and what we're trying to do in the circumstances that we are. And. Um, it's just really, really important that we stick together and that we are visible so that, you know, the next generation is inspired by even more positive role models, role models and, and female leaders. I'm loving as well seeing all of the um, information coming through on the chat section of where people are watching from, what they do, what they might want to do in the future. And, and actually, you know, whether you're in a position that you enjoy and, and want to share that or you're looking for a position, it's just a great opportunity to to put it up there and for everybody else to see. Um, Kelly, can I ask you about the, the importance of, first of all, you seeing women in leadership, uh, albeit fairly few at, in, in your chosen line of work, and then becoming one yourself and seeing the impact that you've had on, on other women? Yeah, I mean, similar to Tanya, I think when I set out, um, fell into football by chance, um, obviously women predominantly excluded from the sport um, as I was sort of thinking about career opportunities, so fell into it by chance looking uh above at the time very very few women in, in leadership roles so um 
you know, it was, um, it's so important. You know, we know why it's important because, you know, diversity makes better decisions. Um, in the football industry, women have been excluded for so long as fans, as players, as coaches, as referees. And if you want to make sure you understand the audience that you're trying to target and bring in, then diversity of opinion, diversity of experiences, women in all levels is absolutely fundamental uh, and critical. But yeah, I guess when I started out, you know, similar to Tanya, when you sort of look up, there wasn't really anyone there, but I've been lucky enough, you know, the FA have sort of invested in my development. I've had incredible male allies. Uh, I've had wonderful women supporting me, uh, mentoring me and helping me, I suppose, to sort of build my, my leadership style and, and, and go from there. Because it's so easy sometimes to, to sort of feel doubt in yourself and, and suddenly go, I can't, I can't do this. And actually understanding that everybody feels like that. Everyone has imposter syndrome, whether it's me, you, any of us on this panel, and we've all had it at some stage. Overcoming that, I think, is quite a big, big leap. Oh, actually, I said earlier that the dogs will let me down and the dogs will let me down. Yeah, no, I agree. I think when I first heard the it was a relief to know that, uh, that I'm not on my own on that um, and that we have days but I think the great thing about working in football and you touched on it earlier Claire you know the sort of the higher purpose and what the development of women's football brings to society and girls and women that sort of you know from those bad days or those days of self-doubt you, you get back up in the morning and, and you go again and, and you you give it your all and, and you try and be bold and brave and, and pick those battles and keep keep moving forward and I think it's you know Th those moments of doubt that's, that's when you sort of drill into the why we're here and and that that keeps you going jill you must listen to that as a player and the talk about resilience and picking yourself up after you know all sorts of things can can arrive as a little hump in the road um what, what have you learned about leadership because i think other players do look at you now as, as a leader on and off the pitch <laughs> Yeah, I think I think what I've learned is you can be a different leader all the time. So I, I was fortunate enough to be in the England squad when Sophia White was there and she was our captain and she was very, she'd talk to you, she'd point the finger, she'd tell you off and she'd really drive you. But then say Kelly Smith took over the captaincy for a bit and she would lead on the pitch, um, just putting, a, putting in a tackle, probably didn't say too much off the pitch, but I think it goes to show that People say you have to have certain leadership qualities, but I think as long as you stay true to yourself, um, you can lead by being honest. Um, it's difficult at times as well. I think I've never really had a captaincy role, but I think obviously being led by Steph Horton and helping her at times and, and her helping me being two of the elder members of the team, I think we're two very different characters, but you can always bring something. Um, I think honesty is probably the biggest one. And, and Fran, if I can ask you about your own position, we'll talk later about um, Goals for Girls and what, you know, teaching leadership to, to youngsters in particular. But for you, was there a breakthrough moment when you thought, yeah, I can do this, I've got this? Yeah, I thought at the beginning when I started this role, um, because I didn't see much females actually delivering organisations like Goals for Girls, I thought that it was going to be much more of a challenge to actually break through and, and it and it was we we launched in 2013 and I would only just say that within the last two or three years we've actually got the recognition from um and kind of the acceptance from the football kind of world of what we're doing and what we're implementing at a grassroots level. Um, I've always said that female leaders are just imp important to change the perceived conception and narratives of leadership roles. And I think that me in the position that I am in and being um, a young black female, I am actually changing the narrative for many young people in deprived communities across the whole of the UK and maybe the world. And I do believe now more than ever, it is important and that we do have females um, representing from all across the board, whether that's on TV, through marketing, on the pitch, off the pitch, at grassroots level. And I feel at this point that over the last year or so, the world has, is finally standing up and listening. Um, we're seeing, like I just said, a variety of pundits, players, matches, um, 
women on and off the screens, marketing, advertising, it's just so much more diverse. And the change is coming slowly, Claire, it is coming slowly. So for me in a grassroots position, I can now go out on the field and inspire, inspire so many girls and give them an opportunity to look at not only myself as a coach, as a female leader, but other people um, within the media and in the industry themselves. And um, for the first time, I believe that we are seeing more we see more examples of female leaders across sport emerging. And I feel like we're now finally all cross-weaving our talent knowledge um, to drive for change. Yeah, and I think you're right. The media plays such an important role in showcasing emerging talent, existing talent, celebrating past talent as well. And actually just, you, you know, almost giving the, the, the limelight, the spotlight in a positive way um, to those women in, in different positions. And, and the more the more the merrier, the more the more important, the more the more of us there are, the less you feel that you're the one that if you make a mistake, you're going to let everyone down. And I felt that in broadcasting. If I make a mistake, I, it's going to reflect badly on every female broadcaster. You feel a huge pressure. And of course, you're going to make mistakes. I do all the time. Um, Tanya, can I talk to you about in depth? Let's drill down a bit into what everybody does and how you feel that you can make a change and what you see in the people you work with. So it, it has been a hugely challenging year, never more so being a coach or a manager. Um, how have you coped and, and what have you adapted? What have you done to make sure your players still feel valuable and mentally healthy and physically if they can be? Because I know there have been issues there. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we've touched on that a little bit there about feeling sometimes like you're not good enough, feeling like, you're making mistakes and um you know that you can't kind of get things right and i think for me at the moment um probably the last nine months um probably a little bit longer than that really towards the end of the last season as well has been probably the most challenging time for me as a as a coach or a manager i'm still fairly new um to my role i don't have all the answers on or off the pitch and i think you know it's been such an incredible effort to get football back women's football back and what we what we know is what we don't know and we're constantly having to adapt and deal with things every day having to think outside the box the players are obviously trying to adjust to the new normal and what that looks like and every day that's different um and it's trying to it's trying to be comfortable in your own skin knowing that you don't know all the answers but also making the players feel comfortable that you are you know you have their safety at the forefront of everything that you're doing that they're human beings and there's things going on outside of football that, you know, we're in a pandemic, you know, they've got families, they've got loved ones. Um, there's things that are impacting their mental health and their well-being that we can't control. And it's about trying to get the balance right. And um, I know that that's really, really difficult for us. We've, you know, we're a smaller club with, with smaller resources and we need to be really creative with what we do. Um, and sometimes we don't always get it right. And it's about being able to hold your hands up as a leader when that doesn't happen, even if it's not something within your control, acknowledging that and sort of trying to work through it with the playing group. And, and we are in it together no matter what happens. And um, that's probably something we do have at Bristol, regardless of results, is that we do stick together. And, um, you know, we are trying to do the best that we can in a, in a really, really tough situation. But the fact that we're back and we're playing football is, you know, it's a privilege and we just have to, we have to work our way through it. I came down last season um, to see you and I've seen your facilities, I've seen your pitch and everything. If, if you had a blank checkbook and <laughs> you could fulfil your own ambitions at, at Bristol City, what would you want to change? What would you want to do? Because it seems to me the gap between the have a lots and the have nots is pretty big right now and will still be when we come out of the pandemic? Yeah, I think um, probably for us having a, um, a designated training facility just for the women's team would be, if I had a blank checkbook, that'd be the first thing on my list. I think trying to create that high performance environment um, day in, day out is half the battle. And whilst we do very, very well with kind of the resources that we've got, if, if there was one thing that I could straight off the bat change, that would be it. Um, for me, I think 
the environment makes the players feel really valued. It makes them feel um, special um, and it allows people to do their best work. So for me, you know, we we are very lucky that we are in a position, like I said, that we're back playing football and um, everyone at the club's doing a great job. But if I had a blank check, that would be the first place that, I, that I'd want to start because I just want the girls to feel like, you know, they deserve the world. And um, I think if they feel valued, they're going to give you a, a whole lot back. And uh, that would be the first place to start for me. One of the big excitements of this WSL season has been the arrival of the, the American superstars. And, and it looks like you're going to be facing one of them on, on Saturday night when you take on Tottenham. Yep, yep. Had a couple on the weekend as well. So uh, it's quite cute. Some of the academy girls aren't quite sure who they are. So it's about, it's about trying to edu educate them. And, uh, you know, some of the questions are, are quite entertaining. But, um, yeah, look, it's a great challenge for our group. And um, that just kind of shows the gap, doesn't it? And and what we're, what we're working with. But it, like I said, it's a great challenge. And I think everyone would love to see Alex Morgan play on the weekend. I, I personally happy for her just to sit on the bench for a little bit and just pop a blanket on but uh yeah it's it's great for the women's game to have such amazing um again female leaders female role models um to go along with the stars that we've already got in this league and actually on that note kelly if i can come to you and ask you about the global attention right now or on the wsl that that hasn't necessarily been there before and a lot of that has come from the interest in America in seeing what their big stars do over here? Yeah, I mean, very much so. I mean, it's been a fantastic sort of talking point, not just in England, but across the world, it's drawn attention onto the Women's Super League. And, you know, we've always wanted, you know, our ambition is to have the world's best league. Um, that's, you know, our ambition in the women's professional game strategy. And that's about attracting the world's best players alongside you know, our, our best English talent as well, getting that blend. So to see some of the players sign has definitely created an interest. Of course, it's at a time when we've sold a number of overseas rights deals as well. So WSL is going out across the world. The Women's FA Cup final went out across the world and, and it's creating more interest in, in, in countries. And that's part of, you know, our commercial strategy, you know, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about later on. So yeah, absolutely great. Great for the fans as well. Obviously you can't see them, uh, face to face at the moment but you know what a chance this weekend to see so many of the top world players playing here and it also makes women's football so much more attractive to a sponsor like Barclays because that is going out there amongst the world and they're a very positive associate it's a very positive association so let's talk about um that that commercial strategy and the sustainability of women's football where do you think we are right now I think we're on a journey um, we've got an ambition that we want the women's uh, Super League yeah, and the women's championship, the women's game to be sustainable in its own, own right. Professional women's football, it will take some time, sort of a medium to long term ambition. We're putting the foundations in place. Barclays is absolutely key to that, as are the brands that are investing at a club level. Um, our new domestic TV deal we're about to announce is really key to that in terms of building audiences and revenue. Our overseas rights are key to that. Their new revenue streams, their global audiences. So those foundations are going in place. We've got a, a really clear strategy around how we build audience, how we build the fan base, how we grow revenue, and ultimately to make it sustainable so that what's happened in the women's game previously in those sort of heartbreaking stories where changes of owners, changes of circumstances in the men's club really impact the women. There's some protection around it. So that, that's why it's so critical for me. Um, and it also means it'll protect the pyramid because as clubs come up um, and play a higher level football, the resources there, you know, through the central distribution to enable them to compete as opposed to whether the men's club are prepared to invest or not. So really fundamental for the future health of the game. I mentioned when I introduced you that it's been quite a week at the FA. Um, generally speaking, how have you found the attitude of those that you have to answer to within the FA to women's football? And is it something that actually has improved massively? And, and where do you think the next couple of years will, will take it? Um, I think, look, our board is half female. Um, our senior management team, I think, is more female. I think it's just tipped the balance. I think it's more women the men. Uh, not that means that it's just women that support women's football. Of course, it's not. There's a huge amount of support for women's football in the FA, um, right at the top level. Uh, our chief exec is a massive advocate of it as well. When we had to make the well-documented £300 million of cuts for COVID, uh, 
the area of the game that I oversee, the women's professional game, was protected. Um, we invest seven million a year in, in Super League and the Championship. That was protected, even though it's really tough, because we know it's such a it's in such a growth phase. It's such an opportunity um, at the moment to to build the professional women's game and have the best league in the world and support our English talent. And so, you know, there was support there from the top to to protect investment. And obviously, we've just launched the new women's strategy as well. Um, and the sort of resources for that have been protected as well. So, so a lot of support and a lot of ambition to really drive the game forward. And as I asked Tanya, if she had a, a blank checkbook, what, what would she do? If, if you really, if you could access as uh, the money that you needed to make, you know, a, a difference overnight, which obviously is an impossible dream, but what, what would you do? What would be the one thing that you'd say that that needs to happen? It needs to happen right now. Well, a one. Well, that's really tough. That's tough, Claire. Uh, well, the clubs would probably say to me professional referees. Um, I'd say uh, alongside investing in, in referees um, and the workforce, um, you know, we've, I think it's been really clear in the last week around the discussion around academies um, that we need more investment in the talent pathway. We need more human and financial resources in the clubs to support the whole of the club. Um, and I think that's been really evident over the last few days that, you know, that's ultimately the issue um, on that one. And um, so I'd say the talent pathway, making it stronger and more diverse. So we've got a pipeline um, of talent coming through both for England and to keep the WSL as a top, top level product is hugely important. Then I think as we grow commercial revenue, you know, the challenges that, that you know, Tanya's been talking about, you know, that the amount that the top clubs can spend versus the bottom, we've got to get more revenue out to the clubs to support them. So in I'll, a, I'll, I'll give me three, I'm sorry. No, no, that's that's fair <laughs> enough. But in, in a way, do you think COVID and everything that's happened because of it has highlighted what might otherwise not have been noticed as much, that there is still a long way to go, both for, for the elite level of, of the game, but also for that, for recognising the youngsters for actually being able to say no this is important this matters this isn't something that can just be stopped um overnight and and, and sh you know regarded as as, as not you, you know it seems to me that it, it was very it kind of hurt it hurts it's not just it's not just a a, a, a sort of a frustration it, it's an emotional pain of that still for young girls not being recognized as this being a professional elite sport that they are training for yeah, no, absolutely. And, um, you know, obviously the first one was just having to terminate Super League and the championship season and the whole pyramid. Um, and I think Tanya mentioned earlier the unbelievable amount of work that's gone in to come back and, and come back as safely as possible under elite protocols. You, you can't underestimate how much focus and effort that took. And then I think what's obviously happened this week now with lockdown, uh, those who've come back under non-elite protocols, uh, which our academies uh, and our RTCs, which don't have the same resource levels. You know, there's a huge gap in resource levels between male and female football. We know that it runs all the way through the system. It's really, really noticeable in that youth talent piece um, where the men's game has invested so much in recent times in, in boys' academies. And therefore, what's happened is obviously as sport locks down, the, the RTCs and the academies are under grassroots protocols. We're working at how many we can bring back as quickly as we can under elite protocols. But yeah, it does highlight that there's still a big job to do to grow revenue, to invest in the whole of the game. Um, a question I think you'll be in a good position to answer from Linda Bush says, how can supporters hold their clubs to account to invest in the women's game? And would it be helpful for them to do so? I think they can. I think supporter pressure definitely helps. I think clubs who've not invested in women's football and some of the bigger clubs, I think they've been called out. Um, I don't want to name individual clubs, but we've seen, you know, whether it's opening training grounds and the women not being there or it's not having a women's team or it's not having a professional women's team when, you know, you're, a, you're one of the big sort of uh, richer clubs, you're called out, you know, fans expecting better, you know, brands expect better, uh, fans expect better. And I think that pressure helps clubs to reflect on what sort of club do they want to be how do they want what how do they want to be perceived what's their role in the community are they open to all you know what's their commitment to diversity inclusion I think I think the pressure helps absolutely and actually even Megan Rapinoe is saying it this week about Manchester United that it's an absolute she, she used the word disgraceful that they took so long to invest properly and you see how much progress they've made 
um, in a relatively short space well, of time. They, yeah, they don't, <laughs> yeah, I, I saw the comments. Um, look, Manchester United, to be fair to them, um, they're doing it fantastically now. They've always had a really good youth pathway. You know, when we talk about investment in talent, they've had one of the best in the country. They've done a fantastic job. So it's really appropriate, right and fitting now that they've got a senior team that, that, that those young players can, can aspire to, to go into. And of course, you know, they've, they've gone top. So, you know, Casey's doing a tremendous job there. Yeah, Casey Stoney really leading the way. Jill Scott, you've got to face them <laughs> this weekend. Um, do, do you notice that the, the, in the build-up to a weekend like this, what's the vibe like amongst the players and indeed in the city of Manchester? Yeah, I think it is exciting. Obviously, when you've got a big derby game, I think not having the fans there, um, it'll be different this time, definitely, because they definitely give us a lot of grief on the side when, when you're playing against Man United, but it adds to the atmosphere and I love games like that. Um, I think in training amongst the girls, Tanya will probably tell you the same, when it's a big game, you just try to keep it consistent, uh, stick to the process of training and kind of not play to the occasion, but just stick to what you can do and not focus too much on the opposition. So, yeah, I think there would have been a, a bigger vibe around the place if you knew that the fans and everything were going to come, but we're going to have to create our own noise on Saturday. How much are your local media covering, covering it and in terms of, of, you know, Manchester TV, radio and, and newspapers? Yeah, I think I've heard quite a few things that there's the big derby game this week. Obviously, you mentioned it's going to be on BT Sport. Um, I've seen it mentioned on Twitter and social media a lot, which is the way to get to the public nowadays, I think. So, yeah, it's, it's great. And as I say, I, I love the fact that Manchester United are, and now have a women's team because I think these derby days are, are fantastic. I grew up Sunderland versus Newcastle and um, they were the biggest days in our household. So I think now to have that uh, derby fixture in, um, it's great. And as I say, I think the, the media around it's always good. Um, and I think all the work that's going in behind the scenes, I feel so fortunate even listening to this panel. I, I just have to do a few shuttle runs in lockdown and I'd much rather be doing that than the work that's gone in behind the scenes to get the game going again. So I think as players, we're just so appreciative that we get to step onto that pitch. And it's not like too much has changed for us, but we do appreciate the work that's gone in behind the scenes. And, and actually, just a, a word on, on Casey Stoney, who you would have played alongside. The impact that she's made as, as a coach and as a leader and how much she's getting out of those players right from the start of the season and and with them really pushing their being at the top they, they've set themselves a whole new level haven't they yeah I never doubted Casey um she's one of my good friends obviously not this weekend but yeah she's she was a fantastic player and she always put so much time into off the pitch as well she was really good around the players and I always knew one day she'd be a coach a manager and I think I I was going to say man management, women management <laughs> um, skills would, would be fantastic. And I think that's why she's got the girls, girls in a good place. Um, and she's so diligent and hard work. And um, I'm sure it's the same for Tanya and all of the managers out there. The amount of work they actually put in. We get to go home, say, two, three o'clock. I know that they're still working until very late hours on a night. So, yeah, I think work ethic is, is really the secret to kind of what she's done at Manchester United. But you have already taken steps to to get, give yourself the qualifications that would be needed to go into that sort of a role. And as we are encouraging freedom of, of ambition um, in this webinar, what, if you were being really, you know, if you gave voice to the biggest dreams in your head, what do you want to be doing in, in five or ten years time? Well, that's a tough question for me because I'm, I'm only thinking to tomorrow and thinking I've got to take a passing drill. I'm stressing out about that a little bit. Um, but no, I think, yeah, working, working in football, coaching, um, women's football, boys football. I think I'm lucky enough that I do my own soccer camps. And I think one of the, the biggest compliments that I sometimes get is that it's for girls football at the minute. But they're like, can my son come along and stuff like that? And I think that goes to show how much women's football has grown, that names now are recognised. Um, we have kids coming up to the soccer camp and they've got Lucy Bronze, Steph Horton on the back of the shirt and... I think that shows the growth of our game. But yeah, I definitely want to stay in football. It's all I've ever known from the age of six, six or seven. Still feel like I've got a few years left playing. But yeah, definitely being involved in football because it would just feel very weird to have life without it. 
Obviously, Manchester City have got fantastic facilities and really do treat their women's team on a, on a level playing field with their men's. Um, what has Lucy Bronze and Alex actually as well, who's come back from Lyon, what have they told you about the setup at Lyon and what and what they've done to make themselves the most successful women's club in, in the world? Yeah, I think having conversations with them, um, I think even speaking to them, we have better facilities at Manchester City. So that shows that like it's not just down to the facilities, obviously mindset, coaching, everything like that. You've got to think at Leon, they've got a group of players that have been together for so long, such experienced players. But I think Lucy feels very lucky to have what we have at Manchester City. So I was a bit like that, like what's the secret to the success? Because I think as you get older, you want to try and kind of get into as many environments as you can, especially ones that are successful. But I don't think we're far off, to be honest. Um, I do agree with what Tanya says, that we need to make sure that the clubs that are kind of getting a lot more resource and uh, having, say, better training facilities and stuff like that, we need to make sure that the whole league is getting that because there's no point in a group pushing away and then getting getting a big gap. So I feel very fortunate to be at Manchester City, but I think it's so important that um, as players, if in any way we can help, we really want the league to be as competitive as possible and I think sometimes it's um, I'm always the the positive one but I've, I've been on this journey for so long now starting at Sunderland starting at Everton and I never really dreamt of being a professional footballer and sometimes it is nice just to pause and think how far we have come um, in women's football but then also to realise how much more there is to unlock so I think it should be a massive pat on the back to everybody involved as to how far the game has progressed and the opportunities now available for women to referee, to manage, to coach. Um, but then also how exciting to see how far we can go. A um, question for you from Alison Palmer, who says at Lewis FC, we're trying to develop young leaders and young role models sometimes they struggle when it's a tough game heads go down and rather than encouraging each other they can at times give each other a hard time could Jill comment for all the young players what ethos and philosophy the lionesses put into practice we are trying to instill uh, in, in encouraging each other supporting each other um, have each other's backs and positive leadership how do you and indeed um, your fellow lionesses and and your teammates at Manchester City show leadership in those moments and drive the team yeah I think that's something that we we still have to address at the highest level I think if you're looking to compete and be successful, and um, there's always going to have to be difficult conversations, but it's just the way in which you speak to people. I think if you have a solution rather than just mourning and complaining, I think you can always put things across in the right way. It's hard sometimes in the moment, in the middle of a game, it's hard to suddenly be dead calm and, and say something. But I always just think if you have that respect and that's about building relationships off the pitch and, um, and then when you get onto the pitch, if you do say something to each other, it's it's then left on the pitch. But as long as you're all striving towards the same goal um, and you're doing what's best for the team and it's not about you, um, I think eventually kind of them conversations do get a little bit easier. But I wouldn't discourage against having them because it's shown that you're passionate um, and that you're successful and that you want to win. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. I think there's a key to turning the light outwards to almost taking yourself off selfie mode. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> to use very yeah. modern parlance and turning the camera out and saying, how is someone else doing and can I look out for them? Um, yeah. Fran, I'm, I'm so excited that, that you are with us today and I, and I really want to ask you about what you see because you see it firsthand and I talk about the power of football to change lives. We all believe in that, but you actually see it and, and you must have loads of examples of how confidence builds in, in girls that... that might come to you feeling really full of doubt and very self-conscious. Um, can you just share some of those stories and examples? Yeah, so um, Goals for Girls works with over 400 young women and girls weekly um, within the UK, um, specifically in London. And um, within our programmes, we combine education and sports to raise the confidence and aspirations of young women. Um, our programme is split into two parts. So we have our mentoring programme, but then we have our sports participation programme on the football pitch. And what we found that is a lot of our young women and girls, when we actually educate them around confidence, team building, um, their body image, 
their self-esteem and things like that through a detailed workshop and then we implement that on the football pitch we see such changes from them we have so many girls um as you all are aware on this on on this call that there's so many barriers for young people and young women and girls, especially in high areas of deprivation, to get involved in sport. Some of these could be safe facilities. Some of them can be the fact that they financially cannot get involved in, in, in grassroots teams or professional teams um, or just organizations like myself. So providing a service which is free for the young people, that means that we can start building on them blocks and them stepping stones. Um, we have girls on the program who literally cannot speak English. And just by our coaching methodology and just by basically um, giving them an environment where they feel welcomed and it being a female environment, we find that the young women thrive. They build on their confidence. They openly talk about the, the issues which are going on at home because they see another female role model on the football pitch as their coach. So they open up about things like periods. They open up about things like body issues, maybe boy issues or friendship issues. The girls um, who ne never normally would speak to one another um, suddenly on the football pitch, they are now best friends. And we found that we've broken down through the program postcode barriers. And we always say that this is um, predominantly seen with, with young boys and young males, but it's for young females as well that the fact that they won't go to a certain area because of the postcode bar post barrier wars. So we find that by integrating all of our girls and our programs together and doing trips and doing um, football summer camps and things like that, we are breaking down these not only societal, society norms, but we're breaking down these community um, barriers amongst these young women and girls through the program. And we offer the girls basically opportunities to become their best selves. We offer them coaching opportunities so when they get into year 11 for the girls to really rate. I'm so sorry if you can hear loads of noise in the background. The kids are playing. <laughs> My office is in the school, so I'm sorry about that. But um, we offer the girls basically um, their coaching badges. We offer the girls as well um, opportunities to see female role models like everyone who sat on this panel today so that they can inspire to become leaders themselves. Um, and I find that just by having people come down like N.A. Luco or Danielle Carters um, or Jill Scott's, we find that it opens up a whole new world of opportunity um, for the young people. And that just alone builds their confidence that, that everything is possible for them. Um, so yeah, we, we find that just through having these general conversations with them and ensuring that the environment is open and fun and engaging and there's no barriers for them to participate that we are breaking down so much more than we can think of. And a story to tell you is the fact that we had some um, girls, when we first started the program in 2011, one of my main barriers and issues was the fact that we had a group of girls, Asian girls, and we had a couple of male coaches. And we found out at the very beginning of Goals for Girls that actually their parents wouldn't actually allow them to engage in the coaching sessions. Um, and we found at that point, it was a barrier. Now that might not be the same now, um, but at that point we found it was a barrier. So we lost over 50 young women um, within a community in East London because of the fact that their parents just wouldn't allow them to participate because it was, they didn't want them to basically um, wear certain things playing football because it was a male coach. So already there, just by having female coaches, we're able to build confidence straight away and instill that in all of our young people. And actually, I think that reflects as well, you understanding people's fears, their concerns and, and responding to them and being flexible. Um, how, much of a, how much of an effect has lockdown had and, and who, you know, who, who is suffering in a way the most? Because you must, you, you must be very, very well aware of, of what it's doing to... And I know actually you've got a nine-year-old son, haven't you? And he's very frustrated to not be able to go out there and play football. Yeah, I think as a parent first, first hand, um, I was saying that 
once I take off my coaching and and CEO chief exec hat, I and I become mum again, um, I very much see the high impact it's having on children younger than what who I deal with in school, the school environment. Um, my son alone, he had a total breakdown the other day, and about the fact that football had been taken out away from him again. Um, he he felt like he didn't know whether he was coming or going. And for me, that's the first time I've seen a child as young as nine actually have a mental breakdown. And that was very um, emotional for me, um, not only as a woman, but because of the fact, not as, only as a mom, sorry, but because of the fact that, because of the environment I work in, I never thought it'd be my child breaking down like that. So um, there was a lot of work for me to do at home, <laughs> not only at home, but also in, 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 in work as well. So um, over the past few weeks, we found that the young women's mental health has been um, extremely impacted through through the COVID situation. If anyone's aware of Goals for Girls, we have a high proportion of our young women and girls who have um, mental health needs. They've been referred to the school because they may self-harm, they've got behavioral issues, they may be carers for their parents or people at home, they're in care. We just have a vast array of issues um, across our program, which we, we support and, and we battle with every single day to ensure that our girls don't allow that to be a barrier for them to get on this on the football pitch and participate in something they absolutely love. Um, so we are finding it a lot more at the moment that we're having to deal with a lot more cases of things like self-harm. Um, mental health issues, the fact that kids do not want to come into school. Um, our development centre has been closed since the beginning of lockdown. We've not, our development centre runs on schools facilities and because the school facilities, some of them do not want to open it up to ex like the external community. We're finding that, well, we can't, in, we can't mix the bubbles. Um, so that has had a massive impact as well because it stops from the girls who we take from schools and put into our development centre, the gifted and talented ones, it's prevented them from actually progressing on their talent pathways into maybe grassroots or professional clubs. Um, so already they don't know where they actually belong in society and I feel like our young people at the moment are unsure about their education, um, they're unsure about their futures and they're unsure about their sports. I think you're right, that uncertainty that everyone has been dealing with, it, it particularly impacts the young and, the, and there's so much that, they, that, that they've had to stop doing. Hopefully the news this week about, about vaccines, many, many come, not just Pfizer, but lots of companies saying, yeah, this is going to be ready to roll out soon. And also the quick testing, hopefully that will mean things start to open up. But obviously your funding has probably been affected as well. Who funds you and, and how do you get the money? Sorry, say what you said on the last bit, Claire. Um, who, who funds you? How are you funded? And, and how do you get the money you need? Um, it's funny you asked that question, actually, Claire. Um, for an organisation like myself, who works with so many young women and girls, we actually struggle to get the funding we should be getting um, to have the impact. For such a small organisation like ourselves and the reach we have, um, we do really, really well on the, on the pots of funding we do actually get. Um, and the impact we do have with our sustainability rates amongst young women and girls is absolutely outstanding. We have a very minimal drop off rate. And I think that's because we paid attention to a lot of the, um, a lot of the basically, we paid attention to a lot of the barriers over the years, which young women, women are facing. And we, we address those needs immediately within our organization the best way we can. So that's probably why we've been able to, to engage so many young people. Um, but in regards to our funding, it mainly comes from private um, sectors in regards to um, our funding. Obviously you can see we're, we're sponsored by Adidas. So they support us a lot with um, a lot of our stuff, which goes on in the local communities. Um, but in regards to what we can possibly do, there's a lot more work which we should, which, there's a lot more support we need as an organization to ensure that we can have a sustainable lasting impact for young people. Um, and I think that that's been a massive barrier for us um, as an organization that the funding pots aren't actually um, that, that accessible. Um, we're not a charity, we are a CIC. Um, we are converting into a charity now because we understand that the fact that, look, not everybody wants to contribute to a CIC. Um, despite 
how well your numbers are, your stats are, or how good your work is. Um, so we are converting to a charity. Hopefully we'll reach that milestone by next year, February, March. But um, again, like I said, there's, there's probably more organisations like myself who do struggle to get funding, who are doing long lasting impactful work. Um, we find just within this, where we are at the moment that a lot of the funding pots go to the same organisations. Um, and the more we we recognize and shout the names of organizations and um, not only just myself but I know that there's so many more out there who are doing amazing work in their local communities the more we can have a an impact within communities which we I don't like the word hard to reach but there's kids there who maybe don't get the opportunities they deserve to to get um I cannot do it alone so yeah yeah, it's that untapped potential. And and the, the, I wonder as well, I mean, obviously you, you've got great success rate of preparing players and that connection with the elite player pathway, really important. But a question here from Sean Miles, who says there seems to be more and more opportunities for development in usual football roles, such as coaching and officiating. What other opportunity area would you like to have a bit more focus on and investment in to get more women working in supporting football roles? Are there any around that you would recommend? And, and Frank, if you wouldn't mind sort of starting with that and then Kelly, I'll come to you in terms of where you think women could could equally be reaching into in the in the broader world of, of football. Um, I think I think you're right by the coaching and the refereeing roles. I think they've been a key over the last couple of years of ensuring that we've got more vis visibility in that. Then we've got the on-screen pundits, which we we are we are creating more pathways in. Um, if I was going to like, for example, take out my book and say, what do we need? I think that we need um, to shed some light on basically the people who. It's a difficult question, actually, because there's so many which we basically should shed a light on. But there's basically, I think to myself that the the players who are up there at the top, I think that basically them them basically being given a lot more time to maybe work with some community organisations um, and actually show the girls or the girls getting the opportunities to come into these facilities. Um, and funding being put in those kind of aspects there where they can actually see first-hand development pathways um, rather than us just talking about it. I think that a lot of the young people we work with, once they see something, they actually believe it. So once they see a process and a pathway, uh, just a prime example of that is um, Karen Hills at Tottenham. She's always gave us an opportunity, it goes for girls to go down with a coach load of kids and um, go and they use their coaches for the day go down and actually the girls get a top level notch coaching for the whole day. Then they go through the whole college and college experience with the, with the staff so that they can actually get an insight into the world of football prior to um, choosing their exams and um, choosing whatever, whatever pathway they, pathway they want to go down. I think that it's, it's easy for us to say, okay, let's be a coach, let's be a referee, let's be a, um, a player. But what about everybody who's working behind the scenes or at football, in the football world? I think that that's, that's the opportunities which are missed for our young people is the fact that they're not seeing the hard work which does go on behind the scenes. And to be able to access that kind of development pathway and see how that works will give them a greater understanding of the development and the way the pathways they want to take in life. And actually, Kelly, that point Fran makes about they don't see it, it's there. You know, you walk into any football club and, and the receptionist will nearly always be female. The PA to all the top will be female. The nutritionist is probably female. The physios will be female, but you don't see them. And there are all of these career opportunities that maybe some girls are not actually aware of that if they've got an interest in football, that you don't just have to be uh, involved on the, on the playing side. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge industry, isn't it? You know, and it's it covers everything from the commercial development of the game, lawyers, you know, you name it, the, the game needs it. And there's thousands of jobs in the football industry. And of course, the, the great work that women in football do to support um, women moving through the industry, moving up the industry, industry supporting uh, women in leadership is absolutely critical to making sure that women are represented in all of those roles. I think the key one for me that I'd really like to see a gear change on is the roles in the football clubs. I think the, the development of women's football 
um, in the clubs as this clubs have got really stretched resource. Some of the clubs have got really stretched resources and I sort of urge the clubs to really sort of think through have they got the right level of resources to really support the massive growth that's going on in the women's game in terms of its sort of its profile and its development and not just you know in the senior environment but in the whole sort of youth setup as well you know and we've sort of touched on what challenges that leads to it's been very you know very uh, clearly highlighted over the last week or so and also you know I think it's great to see that football's launched a diversity code and that very much sets out you know public ambitions public accountability of clubs to have more women and greater diversity in its senior management teams and in its coaching positions obviously you know and, and I think that's a big big step forward um, for the game um, but I'd sort of urge clubs really to, to look at where women's football sits in its club making sure it's represented at the highest levels you know it's great to see Villa appoint any as sporting director you know, so that women's football and women are represented at senior levels in clubs and they've got the right resources to absolutely maximise this huge growth that's going on now. And actually, Jill, um, Claire Rafferty is involved, doesn't she, at Chelsea, in terms of on, on the sponsorship side of the commercial side. Um, there are, you, you will have known from your teammates and um, all your friends, the different jobs that they've gone into once they've finished um, playing. Yeah, it goes to show, I think, obviously, people say, do you want to be a coach or, as you say, a referee? But yeah, I know some of the girls want to get involved on the sports scientist side. And the way that the game's grown now, you do have positions where there used to be a time where the manager would be everything, should be the kit woman, the nutritionist, should be doing all the logistical side and everything. So there's definitely roles there, as you say, Claire Rafferty's doing sponsorship stuff. Um, you've got the girls now going into punditry. Uh, core comms when the games are on the radio so yeah loads of different opportunities it doesn't I know a lot of the girls don't want to go into coaching um, probably because they know how hard they are to coach on certain days so yeah there's loads of roles out there and I, I think that's the beauty about football it doesn't have to be just being on the grass there's so much other stuff now goes on behind the scenes um, point made here by Polly Shute, who says, I think the holistic benefit of sport for young women is a great way to approach sponsorship. It goes way beyond branding. Um, and Ollie Walsh says, and Tanya, I'll ask you this, what would the panel like to see brands do more of above and beyond investment to help grow and develop the women's game? I think for me, the thing I always think about what makes me happiest in terms of when I see a sponsor come on board and for me, it's visibility of the game. So whenever I see a, um, whenever I see a massive billboard or I see a, a, a women's football advert or I see things like that and they're, and they're really sort of increasing the visibility of our sport, um, using female role models, female leaders within those sort of campaigns, I think it's amazing. Um, uh, and that, that for me is, I always just think about what do I like? So what draws my attention? I see, a, you know, maybe a visa ad and it's got, um, you know, some fantastic female footballers on it and straight away my eye goes to it. And I just think, gosh, if I'm working in women's football and that draws my attention, I can only imagine that there's, you know, a few thousand other young, young ladies out there that see those um, role models on the TV and think, wow, I want to be like that. So for me, I think it's about visibility, not just, just not, not just the money aspect, but really promoting our game and just sort of touching on some of the stuff that, that the, um, the other panellists were talking about with dual career, you know, um, it doesn't always just have to be a, a, a player on there. It can be different roles and, um, you know, within, within sport. And I think that's fantastic because it's something that we're really pushing at the moment thinking, getting our players to think about dual career and what they're going to do next. And, it, you know, like Jill said, it's there's definitely a move away from that whole coaching piece and, and using other um, other areas of the, the game to, to think about what you're going to do after football. Yeah, I mean, so um, there are lots of questions on here that I won't have time to get to because I'm very conscious of the clock and I realise people are booked in from 12 till 1 and I don't want to overstay our welcome. Um, but, but Kelly, if I can just finish with you on that message about sponsorship and what brands can, can bring, what, what would you like to see from those that can help financially, let's hope, as, as markets begin to pick up around the world and things begin to be a bit more positive? Yeah, I think, you know, obviously when Barclays came on as title sponsor, I think, you know, they're such a credible brand. They've got such a great track record in helping develop professional men's football. I think it was a real statement of intent. And I think the great thing about the partnership with Barclays is you've got a real sort of aligned um, higher purpose around giving girls opportunities and that whole, you know, 
the support of enabling girls to play football in schools right through to, to, to the dream of being a professional footballer. And of course, you know, we know from our fan research, there's about 6 million football followers, a male skew to them, um, who are increasingly, you know, follow men's football, increasingly following the whole club, coming over into women's football. Barclays and other brands like that can help open new audiences um, and, and get it into new audiences. So, so yeah, they play a fundamental role, you know, in, in the marketing, um, in, in sort of the statement of where the where the, the sport is, and of course, you know, the investment they're making. I think what's been brilliant has been how many brands, even in these tough times, have got are making major investments in the clubs. I know Everton uh, announced a, a big partnership recently, but there are a number of clubs where brands um, and obviously Vitality the women's FA Cup are still getting behind women's football because it's growing so quickly um, even even in these tough times. Brilliant thank you so much thanks to Kelly Simmons to Francesca Brandt to Tanya Oxtoby to Jill Scott good luck to Jill and Tanya at, at the weekend and to all watching just a reminder those matches you can find them on BT Sport or on the BBC or on the FA Player all the matches this weekend are live and available thank you to Barclays for their support and to women in football so the final word to their chair, who, by the way, you must watch her TEDx talk, uh, Ebru Kirksell. Just unmute, Ebru. Yeah, so we only have a minute anyways, and I'm using part of that on mute. But many, many thanks, Claire, for the wonderful moderation. It was such a dynamic discussion. I kept taking a lot of notes and um, really, really big shout out to Kelly and Jill and Tanya and Fran for their amazing contributions and insights. And as usual, to Tom, uh, both personally and as a, as a corporation for their support for women's football and women in football. Uh, we have started these webinar series and round tables in the beginning of the pandemic as an adaptation to the realities of, of today's world. And they've been so amazingly useful for everybody. I think ju not just for connections, but for providing great insights as well. And if you were following the chat, there were many suggestions about how to move this energy and dynamism into maybe giving support to the FA. So many people on this call were uh, working on the girls' uh, football side and it's on us to try and sift through it and try to actually turn this into a productive um, uh, initiative as well. But today there was a lot of discussion about the importance of visibility of role models and uh, also the role of credible allies, credible male allies. And um, Claire, you put it quite nicely that no matter what level you're in, you still have lots of self-doubt and imposter syndrome. And Kelly said having a higher purpose actually helps you to overcome that a little bit. But I agree with you, Claire, a lot that every time you, know, you are under pressure to perform, not on behalf of yourself only, but on behalf of all the other women who might be following in your footsteps to make sure that you're not the last one to who holds that prestigious position wherever you are. Um, I love the question about if you had a blank check, what would you do? Um, well, Kelly actually took three wishes. She said she would invest in referees because that would be the wish of the clubs, but also to the workforce, especially on the academies and the, the talent pathway. And I 100% agree with that. Tanya made a wish for a designated training facility for, for her teams because this will help the girls who are playing to be valued, to feel valued and special, and that would definitely increase their performance um, as well. Fran, you know, uh, kudos and hats off and everything. You are doing an amazing job with very little resources, breaking down community barriers and giving girls a chance to be their best self. And um, we are definitely here to help in any way we can in your future work. And Jill, you talked about uh, the importance of honesty in leadership and how it's actually situational. This is something we talk a lot about in our leadership courses. So I was very happy to, to um, hear about that as well. And also, um, Kedi stressed the importance of having more female 
females and role models in football clubs because that's where the lifeblood of football is where it's really happening and also Jill you talked about um, how you have an ambition hopefully to remain in football in the future to be a coach perhaps and also uh, your aspiration to help grow all football together not just you know some of the bigger clubs but it that which grows as an ecosystem um, so let me not take up any more of your time, but uh, please keep following us. I think we have a wonderful community here and um, also self-belief is extremely important. I don't know if Denise Richmond is still here. She wrote in the chat that she started out as a volunteer in grassroots football and look where she is today. She won the election this summer to be the first ever female president of a county FA. And, um, you know, we're very, very proud of her. So any one of us could dream and become anything we want in football. So many, many thanks for being here today with us.